All right. Thank you so much for tuning in today for this uh, next segment of our virtual mind walk series. We've been really looking forward to this one. We have um, Nick Babin with us here today, and he's going to present agriculture's role in landscape conservation. Um, Nick is an assistant professor in the Natural Resources Management and Environmental Sciences Department at Cal Poly. He holds a PhD in agroecology from UC Santa Cruz and utilizes interdisciplinary approaches to understand and promote sustainable land management and community development in both tropical and temperate landscapes. His research has evaluated the impacts of fair trade marketing networks and the adoption of agroecological farming practices on reducing smallholder coffee farmer vulnerability in Costa Rica. Nick's recent research evaluates the obstacles and opportunities for the adoption, maintenance, and diffusion of sustainable agriculture and climate change best management practices in the United States. All right, Nick, take it away. Great, so thanks for having me. I'm gonna share my screen. And it looks like I was disabled, so you're gonna have to re-enable screen sharing. Let me get that here. All right, let me know if it works for you. Yeah, now. That, that works. Sorry about that, Nick. No worries. <clears throat> All right, so as was mentioned, yeah, I teach at Cal Poly. I teach uh, mostly classes, uh, agroecology, I teach natural resource ecology and some social dimensions of sustainable agriculture. And yeah, I got current research looking at specifically the wine uh, grape growing sector on the Central Coast and uh, looking at climate change adaptation and introduction of kind of biodiversity friendly practices. I'm also doing some research uh, surrounding kind of ecological and economic evaluation of vegetable intercropping here on campus. So we're experimenting with different vegetable intercrops. And then I continue to work uh, in Costa Rica on the, the shade coffee work, as was mentioned. Um, so yeah, today I kind of want to talk about kind of a broad level view of uh, agricultural landscapes and their potential for conserving biodiversity. I mean, we, we I would imagine many of you who are on this uh, talk enjoy uh, many things about nature, but you know, the characters, the, the, the incredible diversity of life, the colors, the the um, just the incredible richness on this planet. Um, and in fact, you know, we do have uh, over 2 million species that have been described to science, but we know that that's just the tip of the iceberg. We're discovering new species every day, pretty much literally. Um, and the you know, best guess is anywhere between five and 15 million species on this planet. We get some higher estimates when we extrapolate from kind of, uh, well, the beetle, the coleoptera, um, and, and beetle family um, could be responsible for five to 15 million themselves. We just don't actually know. So where is it? Um, probably aware of the adage, right? Tropical rainforests are a very small proportion of the Earth's surface, 3%, but contain about half of its known species. So those low latitudes, those areas in the tropics tend to be really diverse. But if you look at this map, you see uh, the regional diversity is the color coded. And you really see, look at us in Central and Southern California, the California Floristic Province has a very high biodiversity, um, highest in, in, the, in the United States and you know, you know, kind of on par with Southern Mexico and areas into Central America, parts of Central America. Um, so we're in a very uh, biodiverse hotspot ourselves. Um, and then extinction, right? We've, we uh, have currently somewhere around 900 species that we know have gone extinct. Like there's probably many more that were just never documented to science before they went extinct. And that rate is increasing uh, somewhere around 780 uh, in 2006. So it, it's, the rate is increasing. And why is it uh, decreasing? Why is biodiversity disappearing? There's this old adage that we teach our students, the hippo. Um, habitat destruction, basic species, pollution, population of exploitation. Really, a lot of these are interrelated. They're not distinct causes, if you will, or drivers. But the big one is habitat destruction. You can look at of the threatened species in the US, and you know, about 90% of them, that's the main driver, is they've lost a lot of their principal habitat. 
So if we think about habitat disappearance, this is kind of a typical pattern of you know a disappearing forest ecosystem habitat. This is um, isn't like yeah, kind of maybe appears like some kind of um, skin disease, but this is a uh, forest cover disappearing in, on the island of Borneo between 1950 and 2020, and a pretty drastic um, amount of reduction in forests. And we know forest ecosystems um, hold really high levels of biodiversity. Turns out that the relationship between agriculture and forest um, loss is a pretty direct one over the history of agriculture since it emerged, you know, whatever, 10,000 odd years ago. We've lost an area around the size of South America uh, in forest due to uh, agricultural, um, clearing for agriculture. And what you see on this map are areas in dark green are kind of what we would say uh, old growth or remaining extant uh, primary forests. And then the light green are ones that have recovered uh, secondary or in kind of some kind of management. And then the reds or reddish browns are places that, you know, the forest is gone and it's really transitioned to another use. And in the foreseeable future, we're not seeing it come, come back. So this is a talk about agriculture and conservation and you you might wonder is there a role could there be you know with this legacy of transforming landscapes and altering habitat and definitely leading to um, the loss of species could there be a role for agriculture and conservation we know parks work right we know that um, you know untouched conservation locking up biodiversity it works it's um, you know it's it's the predominant strategy for conservation since the beginning of the conservation movement. So the question is, can agricultural land play a role here? Um, first, let's look at uh, protected areas and parks, right? We know the first protected area or, or you know, park uh, on paper, right? There was many probably informal, you know, communal agreements to not, uh, to, to maintain and to not harvest from particular areas, but the first kind of nation state led park was Yellowstone in the US 1872 and we kind of see you know over time kind of especially th throughout the 40s and 50s through 70s and 80s the amount of uh, area protected globally has really uh, you know, skyrocketed um, but many of the there's a couple of issues with um, with with parks um, one is that many of them are too small to protect biodiversity expect especially of large you know, predators, uh, large mammals, right? They might preserve some biodiversity, but not the full assemblage uh, that, that historically was, was in the area. And then the other issue is in many areas, this, is, this could be said about the US uh, in our area, particularly, there's not a lot of available land to lock up in parks. We've kind of, we've, we've hit, we've hit the, the easiest, the most accessible, the most um, easily obtainable lands to create these parks. And so now we're kind of, um, you know, thinking about other strategies uh, that could also help to preserve biodiversity. So agriculture enters into the conservation, you know, can we have it both ways? Um, can we produce food and fiber and provide conservation? And really it depends on what happens. So you have this large continuous habitat, it breaks up into small isolated islands of habitat. And, you know, the big question of whether agriculture can contribute is what is, what is the matrix, the agricultural matrix like? And when we say matrix in landscape ecology, it's the most predominant background land use between usually remnant uh, forest patches or remnant uh, native, uh, natural uh, systems. And so the question is how, what quality is that matrix, uh, whether for um, you know, organisms to live in or to pass through between um, more primary sources of habitat? Um, so that's the question. You know, and it's a question that's gotten a lot of, there's a lot of words on this one, but there's, it's a question that's gotten a lot of um, effort and I, I guess research energy over the last maybe 15 years by, landscape ecologists and agroecologists, um, what is, you know, what is the potential of this agricultural matrix? And um, honestly, one of the conclusions, and it depends, right, it, obviously on the system, as we'll talk about here in a minute, but one of the conclusions is that, you know, in the kind of dawning of the conservation movement, um, agriculture was seen as this ocean of inhospitable land where species could not, you know, could not pass through or persist in, 
And we may need to rethink that notion because many species do successfully use these, these agricultural lands more than probably we thought of at the beginning of the conservation movement. Um, and in fact, they may play, these, these lands may, I think they will play in a, a critical role in the future as we think about designing and managing landscapes um, for biodiversity conservation, um, just because of their prevalence. And uh, in many places, there's, there's, not, there's not parkland to lock up. Um, so in these types of landscapes where, where the lands, are, where most of the land has been protected and there's not a lot of new land for parks, um, you know, folk, the protection can focus on, on landscapes. Also, you can think of places where there's very small, like little remnant patch, but most patches and most of the land has been transformed to agriculture or other uses. These are, these are good candidates for focusing on landscapes and, and not um, just the preserves. Um, so in some landscapes, the challenge is not necessarily, right, ensuring that these fragments or parks remain. Um, the problem is, or the challenge is, creating this matrix that can allow um, migration because we know, I'm not without getting into too many of the details, but many uh, organisms exhibit kind of a meta population um, uh, kind of phenomena where they are made up of very good source habitats. You're seeing here on the top right, source sink, good source habitats with high quality or enough land for a sustainable breeding population, a viable population. And then you have these sometimes sink habitats, which can be good resources for part or some of the year, but can't sustain populations all of the year. Um, and so the, the, the challenge is creating matrices and identifying uh, these some of these extant native lands and creating a matrix that will allow migration among the fragments to stem the tide of local extinction so that extinctions don't become um, regional. And so how can it do that? Um, you know, they can provide, again, Populations can utilize the matrix as a corridor, the agricultural lands to pass through between fragments. That's kind of what you see here on the on the top. The matrix would be the white if it's if it's if it's um, um, if it allows passage and, and movement. Secondly, they can provide, and I'll show some really good examples of this in some agroforestry systems species principal habitat. They can actually persist within this matrix, and then. Um, a side benefit of this, which is beyond the scope of what I want to talk about today, but it becomes super important when we're thinking about agricultural production systems and ecological agriculture, organic systems, or even conventional systems, they benefit from this as well. Um, the biodiversity friendly ag um, provides functions like um, pest control, oftentimes that can benefit um, conservation on the landscape. Um, and so all of this kind of fits into, there was a debate in, in conservation biology, um, kind of a sterile debate now around whether you should have a single, it was the Sloss debate, should we have a single large reserve or should we have several small reserves? And it was kind of this vitriolic debate as academics like to do, and they, they had an excuse to write papers um, and, you know, refute and, uh, you know, synthesize and eventually kind of petered out and, you know, single large a single large preserve is great if you have big chunks of land, but of course that all depends on how much contiguous habitat you have. So it really, it, the, moving from the theoretical to the practical, there's so much fragmentation um, that that uh, if the matrix can support movement, then single uh, single or several small might be better. The other thing that I didn't mention about um, about uh, issues with parks is sometimes they just don't support. They don't have the habitat heterogeneity to support the full assemblage of species. And so sometimes on a landscape level, you can have several fragments that actually have uh, you know, different habitat types. And so uh, support maybe a higher species richness um, with a smaller amount of area. That's also feasible. Um, but again, the argument we're talking about today is this, this ag land in the middle. So what about it? Um, so if we think about, this is just, a, you know, obviously an idealized schematics, you move from urban to intensive, maybe the more um, small scale, this is more of maybe a, a tropical developing world model, but could be applied in the U.S. as well, um, and then move to natural ecosystems. So we think about conservation biologists and then landscape ecologists, one of, the, one of their tasks, one of the things that they're looking at, um, amongst others, is to analyze, and that's the circle on the left there, analyze patch sizes needed to sustain populations or the minimum viable population um, and what size patches would be needed 
Um, and then so landscape agroecologists, what we're looking at is we're analyzing the quality and then quantity of the matrix um, within the landscape to kind of, to kind of uh, assess its viability um, for, uh, for a landscape level conservation. So this is a general principle that we work under that, that I would say agroecologists work under in terms of not only we can apply this to agricultural production, but here I'm going to apply it to uh, biodiversity conservation. So the, it's, it's basically the principle of bi uh, biomimicry, right? The greater the structural and functional similarity of an agroecosystem to the natural ecosystems in its biogeographic region, the greater the likelihood that the agroecosystem will contribute to biodiversity conservation. So structural and functional, right? What we mean by the structure are the, the trophic levels, the, so both biological structure, the, the cast of characters, the species, the, niche, the niches available, the trophic levels, but then also the physical structure, like the vertical and then the horizontal kind of patchiness and vertical strata, and then functional, like how does it cycle nutrients and matter um, and uh, support populations over time. So biomimicry, right? And so if we think about it, if we're talking about forestry to talk, or forest ecosystems to start this talk, um, what types of agriculture will support biodiversity conservation in forested landscapes? And you would probably, if we could do, we could be pedantic here, we could say, well, probably agriculture with trees. And so this is a picture, this looks like a forest, but this is actually an agricultural system this is a shade coffee agroforestry system uh, in southern Mexico. So I want to talk a little bit about agroforestry as a, as a potential, um, both tropical and then here locally um, for supporting uh, biodiversity conservation in ag landscapes. So a definition um, system incorporating trees, crops, and then sometimes animals. So you can have trees, crops, and animals, or you can have trees uh, and just trees and crops. And then oftentimes when you're thinking about trees and animals, um, like what's the crop there? If the trees aren't a crop, um, well, the, the, the pasture or the grass that's being grown would be considered a crop in that case. We'll look at some examples here in a second. So trees, crops, uh, and maybe animals, uh, and where these components interactions managed, managed levels. So this isn't just, we wouldn't consider necessarily agroforestry just, you know, setting the, um, setting the, the cattle loose in the national forest. Um, you could, I mean, th there's gray areas, but we're thinking more of a higher level of management of the uh, tree and crop. Um, and so in forested areas, this agroforestry is often the most sustainable form of agriculture, both in terms of input, uh, less inputs, so you're not fighting against nature, but also in terms of biodiversity conservation. So what types of agroforestry systems are there? There are literally dozens the world over, um, many in the tropics, but also some systems I'll point out are more adapted to Mediterranean environments. Um, so classifying them, we have both sequential and simultaneous systems. So sequential systems are, you know, probably the best example of it that, that most people heard of is slash and burn um, or Swidden agriculture. And so this is, this gets a bad rap as being unsustainable because people don't like to see things burn maybe or things being slashed. But actually this is a very sustainable form of agriculture when, um, when population, human population levels aren't very high and the rotation is, is uh, sufficient enough for the forest to regenerate. So you, you slash, you burn, you plant annuals, then maybe some biannuals, maybe you plant, then you plant some fruit trees and then the forest kind of regenerates. You're out of there after, this is just a, you know, the systems vary, but you're out of there after, in terms of agriculture, after three to four years. And then it's recovering, depending upon the natural succession of that particular forest, 30 years, 40 years, then it's back to its reset. And then it's um, it's ready to be entered into the system again. And if you think about it, one of the cornerstones of ecology in terms of, you know, if we had any laws, one of them is habitat heterogeneity is um, key to predicting biodiversity. So you think about a patchwork landscape. And in fact, in Southern Mexico, you see this, where they've had you know, a plot and then this rotating system going on and you've got forests at 30, 20 different ages, that is actually a recipe for, can be a recipe for very high biodiversity because of all the habitat heterogeneity. Um, but again, when population levels get too high then people start cutting short the, um, the rotation and then it becomes, starts to fall apart, be less sustainable. The forest doesn't have time to recover. 
Um, and then simultaneous, these are probably more common. Well, these are more common. These are what we see. These are where the associations stay more or less the same. There's still some variability and obviously some change over time. These are living organisms, but um, much more stable than the, uh, than the sequential flash and burn systems. Coffee is a good example of this. Um, also I'll talk about in a minute, but also agroforestry home gardens. And um, these can be temperate or tropical, but they are very widespread uh, in the tropics. So these are usually right outside the, the house, um, right out back, um, trees, shrubs, herbaceous crops, and sometimes animals very closely tied to the particular livelihood strategy or particular um, environment of that family. And uh, highly dynamic, they change. I've looked at a couple of home gardens 10 years apart and some of the structure stayed the same, the big trees, but everything else changed. That's pretty typical. And all sorts of different purposes here. Um, you know, these are the, the one of the quintessential uh, examples of systems that agroecologists and also ethnobotanists have studied in other uh, in um, tropical regions. Um, and so as, not only so as to understand, but to to also help uh, improve and to spread adoption. Really, a small amount of land needed, um, fairly sustainable. Sustainability is the test of time, and these have stood the test of time, even with you know changing agricultural regimes, changing um, styles of agriculture dependence on more imports on some countries, you still see these systems persist because they fulfill a whole range of cultural, I would say, and social needs as well. Um, it's just economic. They grow a lot of medicinals and, and things that are valuable to the, uh, the home household economy. Again, they're widespread across the tropics. Um, and just some numbers there from, you know, other countries uh, where uh, you can see that they make up a, a big part of the household income. Uh, you know, a third of the income for a lot of families. And in fact, my research in Costa Rica has really documented how farmers have transitioned their coffee farms a lot of times um, from being kind of this monoculture coffee with maybe one shade tree to really diversifying it into a home garden and keeping it right close to the house. Um, so what's some other examples of agroforestry? Fodder banks. So this is an example from Nicaragua where um, leguminous trees are grown and the pods are eaten by the, uh, by the animals. And then the, the trees themselves, the fodder banks are the leaves and the, and the brush are uh, pruned and then slashed in the ground. And that's, these are nitrogen fixing trees, leguminous trees. So they fix atmospheric non-reactive nitrogen uh, from, the, from the atmosphere and make it available to plants. And so then that breaks down and improves the quality of the forage. Windbreaks, I mean, these are an underappreciated. I mean, they, they do their, they have their function of providing a, a break from the wind. We have a great one here at the experimental farm here on campus, but the biodiversity, the associated biodiversity that colonizes those windbreaks and, and uses it as, a, as either a, a passageway, you can see from this picture, it looks like a great little corridor for thinking about moving from one side of the system to another, as well as, you know, residents for cer certain species. They can actually live in these hedgerows. And unfortunately, our windbreaks, hedgerows are, are different, but similar. And unfortunately, we've lost a lot of these, you know, in the U.S., especially, uh, with the, you know, plant fence row to fence row. And in the Midwest, especially, we've lost a lot of our hedgerows, which we're learning have a, a really important uh, role in conserving biodiversity and also providing other ecosystem services like pollination. In Europe, they've been a little, little more reticent to get rid of their hedgerows, and uh, they're probably having... Uh, they're benefiting from the ecosystem services from that. Living fences, this is a really neat example. If you've traveled in the tropics, you've probably seen these and they, they pick a you know, species of plant that vegetatively propagates, meaning you can just lop off limbs off the mother plant, if you will, and stick them into the ground and you know, high moisture level um, in many parts of the tropics, they just sprout and they become a living fence. They stay alive and you string your, if you want to string wire, um, along that, and then you come through and you prune it. Usually, oftentimes, at least in Costa Rica where I've worked a lot, they use uh, oftentimes use leguminous trees, um, so that again they're they're pruning it and that there's a little bit of nitrogen, uh, you know, input into the system. But this has been studied, and the amount of forb native forb, uh, small herbaceous plants, as well as um, uh, birds, uh, birds sighted on these using them, and then. Uh, native forbs growing under them um, is actually quite impressive. So they become repositories for, for biodiversity on the agricultural landscape. And then thinking about movement of biodiversity 
through landscapes, trees and pasture become incredibly important and relevant um, to our area. Um, these trees act, in this case, they're great for, you know, these are a less heat tolerant breed of cattle and um, they act as shade, but they also, I mean, the, the amount of uh, biodiversity that's been documented moving through these systems um, with trees is pretty impressive. So what we would call those are keystone structures. So this is a picture of a local landscape. Um, these scattered trees are our biodiversity hotspots. So we really lose a lot when we just lose a, a couple of trees on the landscape. Um, so this is one, this is maybe a, a landscape where, I don't know, I wouldn't consider this maybe agroforces. These are rangelands, um, but there are systems that we could think about that are very in similar climates to our, our own that are um, agroforestry, legit agroforestry systems. They're managed a little more intensively. So one, for example, are the dehesas or montados. They call it um, the dehesas in Spain and they call it the montados in, in Portugal. And this is a Mediterranean land use system. Uh, so appropriate for our area. It's based on widely spaced oaks. Um, they have a lot of shallow stony soils, but the, the idea here is that they manage the oak, both the spacing as well as the pruning of it for uh, to use for firewood but they produce acorns, wood, uh, charcoal, and cork. But the key product from these are the pigs. They, they graze sheep, goats, pigs, and cattle, um, but the, they were developed mainly to produce fine hams. So these scattered oaks, the, 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 the distance at which they manage them, they uh, yield more acorns than the kind of more densely uh, uh, packed woodland trees. Uh, it's more of a savanna. And this abundance of acorns uh, combined with the understory grazing of the grasses and herbs creates a really high quality pork. And then the wood products are, are also important. Uh, turn, you know, cork, I think Portugal and Spain are the largest producers of uh, cork, natural cork, they still use that. <laughs> um, and these systems, this is a, a, main, a key source of, of cork. The firewood is also uh, important. And so they cover a lot of ground in, in Southwest Spain and Portugal, um, but there's a, there's some, um, you know, there's, they're, they're in danger really because there are very few oaks have been planted over the last century. Um, and so we'll see how these systems progress, but neat idea maybe for our, our local environment. They're also found in Greece, parts of Italy and Sardinia. Uh, they call it, um, yeah, they have different names for it, but similar system. Hardwood silviculture, silvopastoral system. So when we combine um, cattle and, and trees or uh, grazing and trees, it's called silvopastoral. But um, key thing here to, to see is that they're managing for the wood and they're also managing for the cattle. Multiple, this is back east in the US. And then here, this is a, a picture of our local landscape, right? Um, this is kind of a typical East Paso landscape. Um, they either removed all the, either the trees were removed before they set up this vineyard or more likely they removed the trees when they set up this vineyard. Very little connectivity, very little um, biodiversity conservation going on in this landscape, um, unless you're a gopher or, you know, a ground squirrel. Um, in place of that, we could think of, this is also a, a central coast vineyard. Um, you know, let's think about managing the, the cover crop layer. Um, beautiful photo, but think about managing for just for wildflowers, even if you were to just introduce that or a, a blend, um, you know, the loop in there, beautiful plant fixing nitrogen. It's a nit nitrogen fixer. The flowers attracting insects, which impacts pollination. Um, the insects become food for birds, which live in the surrounding forest, you can see there. And then the ve this vegetation, all of it, because it's not um, maybe um, not, not um, uh, tilled, um, becomes home for, you know, all sorts of other associated biodiversity like rodents, um, which can be uh, food for foxes, cougars, coyotes, and can provide kind of a linear, you can see the kind of connectivity maybe between these two patches. So this might be a more biodiversity friendly program. And, you know, biodynamic certification is one certification uh, farms that locally that actually ensures that you maintain trees and you maintain habitat, you maintain connectivity. So it's something to look for biodynamic certification. Here's a central coast, you know, here's a vegetable farm. The, the difference between this and this vegetable farm, right? Very different, right? We have this habitat heterogeneity, the patchiness, 
Um, different markets, obviously, they're going to have to develop in order to facilitate this. Um, but the uh, value to landscape level biodiversity conservation is going to be different. Here's a really neat idea that's taken place, that's taken root in the Brazilian Amazon. And it's the idea of using, um, it's kind of similar to the, the Swidden or the slash and burn system, except the end goal is just to get it reforested, not to return to the cycle. So in areas that are blighted, that have been deforested uh, for, you know, uh, for a variety of reasons, but because the, the uh, forest soils are so thin, it just becomes um, non-productive and um, it's kind of degraded. They plant a variety of crops, but oftentimes it's pepper in the first year. And then the, when the, they harvest that for, you know, and then they plant some fruit trees, they harvest that for a couple, two to three years, then the fruit tree layer becomes productive. And then um, and finally, after, you know, whatever, five to 10 years later, they're no longer doing agriculture or harvesting from there. And you have kind of a secondary forest. And so this is a promising, this has been used by the um, MST in, in Brazil as a, as a model, the Movimiento Sin Trabajadores, I think it's a, a rural uh, agroecological social movement. And they've used this model um, on some of their lands. Another quintessential example of agroforestry is cacao. So chocolate production, the majority of it happens under shade. Um, and then the one that I'm the most familiar with is, is coffee. So I just wanted to do a little, little bit of a case study of coffee, um, give you some, an idea of the level of biodiversity that can be found on these farms. Um, so if we're thinking about coffee and biodiversity conservation in forested tropical landscapes, this system you know, is obviously gonna be more um, conserving than this system. And these are actually found very within a mile of each other. What happened here is that the shade coffee was eliminated um, or the coffee was eliminated due to low prices. And also, as we'll talk about the migration of people out of the area, and these systems take a little bit more labor than this one. This one, you can just let it be. And they're actually, in this area, the cattle isn't productive. It's not the, um, the it's high enough altitude. But the, the pasture doesn't grow very fast. And uh, they get over 10 feet of rain in this area a year. So you can see just the erosion by, you know, not keeping a tree or shrubs uh, surface um, is pretty intense. Um, so this system is definitely going to be more conserving of biodiversity than this one in a forested landscape. And so in order to kind of pick apart, and I'm going to give some examples of how much biodiversity can be found here. But first, you have to think about um, the types of biodiversity. So we think, and I mentioned a couple of times, associated biodiversity. So agroecologists distinguish between planned biodiversity, which is, in this case, it's the coffee shrubs, which are on the forest uh, floor, which makes sense because they evolved as a shrub in the Ethiopian or Eastern African, but a lot of it in Ethiopia, um, rainforests. Um, and then you have the trees, which are also planned for by the farmer. They pick the trees. In some most systems, they're very selective. In some cases, it's a little more just plant it under a native forest and what let it go. But in most cases, they're fairly selective of the trees they manage. And so then you have this backbone associated by our planned biodiversity onto which the plant associated biodiversity colonizes because it's it resembles the intact forest. So, you know, Lepidoptera, Hymenoptera, Coleoptera, all your insect orders, high biodiversity in these systems, small mammals, epiphytes, plants going on plants, going on plants, orchids birds and small mammals. So just to give you an idea, um, uh, just a couple of studies, uh, one that found basically the same number of species, same species richness in shaded coffee as the intact next door primary forest, a little bit different um, assemblage, like some the, the they, were, they didn't have complete overlap, but almost the same richness. Um, there are some, you know, inner forest, primary forest species that won't, won't colonize and won't use the shade coffee, but many do. Um, colleague of mine in El Salvador, over 250 tree species in this El Salvador and shade coffee, incredible. And this is just one little region of El Salvador that he studied, over 250 tree species. And that area is a buffer zone for the largest uh, national park in El Salvador. So it's really providing um, uh, ecosystem services there. My work in Costa Rica, much less tree biodiversity in Costa Rica because their agriculture was actually transformed by uh, basically by our USAID, our international aid um, made a donated or gave a lot of money to their coffee ministry to transform their agroecosystems, uh, their coffee agroecosystems from shade systems to kind of monoculture systems back in the 70s and 80s. Well, we're starting to see 
that's that system starting to fall apart because farmers aren't getting enough money for their coffee and um, and they can't afford the external inputs that those reduced diversity systems require. Um, so we were actually pretty surprised to find over 80 tree species in the coffee in one little region. And this one just blows my mind. This one more speaks of any than anything to just the biodiversity that is there in the tropics. Over 130 ant species, over 120 beetle species in one Costa Rican shade tree in a coffee farm. And it's, it's astounding how much biodiversity there is on our planet and that agriculture can conserve it if it's managed uh, for diversity. So there, here's a you know, picture of a shade coffee farm in Costa Rica. And obviously this system, well, not obviously, I'll tell you <laughs> by studying it, this system harbors a lot more biodiversity, um, arthropod and uh, floristic than this system, which is a more reduced shade system. And then this, this more than, uh, those two more than this complete um, shade list system. And so kind of we, we've developed a typology. You can do this in all sorts of different land uses, but coffee, it's been especially well studied. And again, the, the, there's a, there's, it depends, right? Not all coffee conserves this level of biodiversity. And there's kind of a gradient. You move from the top, this rustic system, which isn't very common anymore. Basically, they just come in and remove the shrub layer from the forest and plant coffee in its place. Um, then you have the traditional polyculture and commercial polycultures, which are fairly common systems with shade. And there's more useful species, a little reduced diversity, but a little bit of a trade-off for higher yields. See, the story here is we, the reason we, the U.S. went in and, and decided to subsidize these systems, amongst other reasons, was that the idea was maybe you could contribute to development and, and rural development because these unshaded monocultures would yield more, right? The problem is that these systems, these unshaded monocultures, if you don't fertilize them, apply herbicides and pesticides, often they fall apart because the tropics are so wet and so biodiverse that nature, nature did not, does not, develop in monocultures in the tropical rainforest. So anything that's a monoculture is fighting against that. And so in order to keep that monoculture, you got to use a lot of inputs. And if prices are good and you can get the inputs, you can afford the inputs, then they do yield highly and maybe you, you make more money. But recently we found that uh, people have seen that they actually yield less because prices are low enough and the external input prices because oil prices have gone up in the last 10 years are really, really high. Um, so the bottom line for biodiversity conservation, these top three levels are the ones that are gonna conserve the most. Um, and some of the work that, um, some of the work that I'm involved in is, is thinking through how to reintroduce biodiversity, shade, uh, biodiverse shade layer into kind of these shadeless systems. And the kind of the, the main way, and this, could, this is relevant, I, I would think for introducing um, an agroforestry system on the central coast as well is start with some service trees that are fast growing and that are going to kind of build organic matter and build soil health. So start with nitrogen fixing trees, reduce your external inputs. Then, and at the same time, you planted some of the natives, but they're really slow growing. You planted definitely your trees for livelihoods and for the birds and for your, definitely for household consumption, but a lot of cases to feed their animals, their pigs. And then finally, you have your um, native trees, uh, which provide timber as well as ecological services. And so um, wrapping up the coffee case study here, one of the, um, one of the, one of the I guess, emphases, emphases from understanding that coffee can uh, conserve so much biodiversity is that um, you know, international aid organizations like the Dutch Development Agency, um, they've been really big supporters as well as other NGOs. I've really focused on shade coffee as like a buffer and as a corridor uh, between preserved regions. So I work in the Southern Pacific zone um, on the border with Panama between, this is La Amistad, which is the big international park up in the mountains. And then the, the Osa Peninsula and Corcovado Park is here. And so this, all this area in pink here along the border has been proposed. And there's been a lot of support from Dutch development agencies and other NGOs to introduce shade coffee uh, where, where it's fallen off and to support shade coffee farmers who already exist so that it can create a, um, uh, a corridor for the movement of, of, of uh, birds, and especially birds and other animals through this area. Other areas where these types of practices have been incorporated into a landscape level approach, um, here on the top left, this is an effort in Brazil using silvo pastoral. So they're doing trees and, um, and animals. 
and they're using it as a rural development mechanism, but also as a way of linking two national parks. I mentioned here on the bottom left, not really the greatest map, but this, I mentioned El Salvador. So El Imposible is the national park down here. And then you have kind of the little larger city and then kind of the corn and bean lands, which are less diverse. Um, and shade coffee has been used as a buffer um, between, you know, for the national park so that animals aren't combined there. And I will attest to, I've seen, I saw an ocelot in the shade coffee um, while, while visiting this region. So animals are using it. And so it's expanded their range, their resources. Here on the, on the right, this isn't agroforestry, this is prairie restoration, but it's the same general idea. Um, NRCS, the USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service um, has supported the identification and then now the um, subsidy, subsidizing farmers and landowners to restore um, both um, prairie strips, so little pieces of prairie within larger agricultural fields and then whole scale prairies in these kind of pink zones that are kind of identified as corridors between these larger extant prairie uh, areas, the yellow ones. And so that's, and that it turns out Natural Resource Conservation Service is a great source of support for landowners who want to kind of introduce these type of practices. They have an agroforestry standard. They can, they can get you um, uh, subsidies or support payments in order to establish it. They have other programs as well that, that support biodiversity friendly agriculture in the US. So really what we're, we're thinking about here is, is a vision of agroecosystem and landscape multifunctionality. So this idea to ma management to conserve all the ecosystem services of a farm uh, and landscape. And so, you know, natural ecosystems, um, this amoeba diagram kind of points out, you know, kind of conceptually that a natural ecosystem provides all these ecosystem services, except crop production isn't, isn't very high. Whereas intensive crop production, uh, cropland is, is really good at providing high um, yields, but then a lot of these other services, it's suspect. And so this idea, this, this multifunctional landscape ideal, um, you know, not just for supporting biodiversity conservation, but also all of these other ecosystem services that we don't really have time to go into today. Uh, but in, inherent in that is the, the necess necessity to analyze the quality of the agricultural matrix within the landscape. So just thinking about some advantages and some maybe challenges of using agroforestry. Um, some of the advantages, depending on the crop and the cropping system, uh, they usually are less dependent on commercial inputs. Um, they often provide pest regulation through diversity on farm diversity, um, often using renewable and locally available resources. And they definitely support more efficient recycling of nutrients. Didn't have time to go into this, but what is the kind of functional role of a tree in an agroecosystem in terms of you know the roots and the crop, the crop roots are usually less deep than the tree roots, and the tree is actually pumping and mining um, nutrients and, and, and materials from lower soil horizons and kind of in flushing it in its, in its biomass. And if those are pruned regularly and managed, then you're actually incorporating um, resources from pl places where they were unavailable. Um, so it really can support um, efficient cycling of nutrients, but they're management um, intensive, as I'll point out in the disadvantages. They oftentimes are adapted to local conditions, especially in the tropics and the systems I'm familiar with. The, the, the shade layer changes based on the country because of the species that are available. Um, they oftentimes priority, uh, prioritize local needs. And what's really cool, especially with the home gardens and some of the other agroforestry systems in the tropics, and as well as those Mediterranean ones, the Dehesas, is they really are, you know, there's this, this, this blend of local knowledge and culture wrapped up into the system and history, um, which is pretty neat. And diversification in some places, you know, these are great options, maybe not on the, for the whole farm, but part of the farm as a diversification of, of, of income streams. And then for our purposes today, right, the whole, the whole topic is biodiversity conservation potential, and many of them do exhibit higher biodiversity conservation potential, um, especially if they're in a forested landscape. And then one thing, an additional thing, you know, trees uh, sequester carbon, and they're, they're, so they're, um, they're a great strategy for uh, climate change mitigation. But then also, and we're seeing this with coffee adaptation as well, as things are getting warmer, um, trees will actually provide um, uh, the more apt habitat, more apt conditions for the coffee 
in systems where they would be kind of marginal if it was sun coffee. So we're starting to see trees as being an important part of being able to be able to continue growing coffee in some places that are warming rapidly. So limitations, um, you can't just willy nilly plant any combination together. You have to know your local environment. You have to know your the kind of uh, potential species that you have to work with. And if you pick the wrong ones or you know the wrong arrangement of them, you can definitely competition is is a is a is a likely result, which could reduce uh, your yields uh, and reduce your kind of your your potential income or potential um, you know performance of the system. So you can't just throw species together. Um, and we're, we're, uh, related to that, I mentioned that it can support um, pest management. Um, through diversity and through creating um, resources for biological control species. So, um, but it can also provide pest habitat. Again, if, you, if you're not choosing your species correctly, this is probably the biggest um, downside to them. The, the labor often, they're more labor intensive than a lot of other syst potential systems. And oftentimes they're not adapted super well to mechanization. Although we do see a lot of mechanized pruning in some of these systems. Um, so what that means is they work less well in areas where there's um, a lot of land and not much labor, right? That's what you see here in this bottom right. There was a, a lot of land available because people were pushed off the land because they couldn't afford to produce coffee that was high external input dependent um, and a lot of people migrating um, out of the area. So not a lot of labor. And so this, these are hard systems um, to manage in those areas. But it doesn't mean a small, you know, a landowner can't in, in, in introduce them as part of their farm, right? It could be a hedgerow, right? It could be a scattered trees um, in a pasture. Another, you know, limitation is that some of these products like timber are, you're going to be thinking about the next generation, right? You're not, uh, the, the uh, return time for investment is long. And so you have to have like a different mind, a different time frame, and a different mindset on profit. Um, it can be uh, competitive in terms of income, but you have some of these uh, harvests are on a, a different time frame than others. And again, management and knowledge intensive. So they do take, you know, they're not. These aren't necessarily always just you know cookbook systems where, but no agriculture is. But some are more, you know, cookbook systems than others. These are a little more adaptive. Uh, take a little bit more adaptive management. So yeah, it's kind of wrapping up. I mean, one of the ideas here the, the, is, can we support conservation and livelihoods? And I think the answer is yes, um, in many cases um, through agriculture. And it's gonna depend on you know, biodiversity friendly ag, identifying those systems that work in a particular bioregion, a particular place, creating those high quality matrices, doing some landscape level planning. I didn't mention that, but that's, that's the role of hopefully our agencies and our, as well as NGOs are in, involved in, in the tropics a lot. And then what you're gonna get, hopefully, if you've designed and identified good uh, biodiversity friendly ag systems is this migration counteracting extinction in these fragments. So you have populations that are able to move between um, through the agricultural matrix. And in the end, hopefully we have improved conservation outcomes and improved livelihoods for, for farmers. So just the like last, I think, um, concludes, concluding slides of, okay, what now, where do we go? How do we, how do we in, involve ourselves in a biodiversity friendly ag or how can we uh, continue and accelerate support for it? Well, in the US it, policy and uh, government and then government making policy is super important to the, supporting this type of agriculture, both through subsidies um, as well as valuing these systems. So the farm bill, right? Um, the, the farm bill outlines and often outlines the budget and the priorities for the Natural Resource Conservation Service amongst other agencies. And again, if you're a, right now it's, you know, it's, um, it's a good time. They're, they're, they have a good number of programs, but that's always subject to political will and change. It's all voluntary, but I would encourage you if you're interested in introducing some of these practices to reach out to your local NRCS uh, or RCD Resource Conservation District, they might be able to, to, to help you design and maybe get you some funding to do it. But we should also be thinking politically about supporting those, those platforms that wanna support this type of agriculture. Civil society and social movements in the developing world, social movements are super important. There's a group called Via Campesina, which is a group of, of agroecologically minded farmers uh, and their social movements and for pushing change and for pushing support for this type of agriculture. Um, and then in the US, it's less 
maybe I would argue less social movements, more civil society, NGOs, lines blurry there. But in terms of, you know, like the Wild Farm Alliance is a really cool California based organization um, that's that they do a lot of teaching and research around this. They have really cool webinars. If you're interested in this stuff, Google them on YouTube, Wild Farm Alliance. They have a ton of farm tours where you can see California specific examples of this. So they're going to be super important. Support them. And then research. When we think about agroecological systems, and especially whole another argument about yield and whether they yield as much as organics. I mean, one thing that's really important to point out is that um, the more industrial model has received 100 times to one the amount of research over the 20 and early 21st century um, from our government, right? So we haven't, we haven't really dedicated much research to these systems. They, they tend to be underfunded. That being said, the last farm bill, 4% was going to these research of organic and ecological systems. And it was one hundredth of a percent 10 years ago. So that by just orders of magnitude is a lot, but it's still only 4%. Um, and then we need, we need research, not just on the practices, but a big part, and this is something that I'm focusing on now is the adoption. So what, what makes a person adopt these practices and what keeps people from adopting these practices? And then finally, the ones that you always hear about because we live in the U.S. is oh, this is who makes change: corporations, consumers, markets. And that's true. That's if you if you demand it, hopefully people will produce it in that way. So there are you know, there are certifications that you can support: shade grown, you can support biodynamic uh, wines, um, uh, and so markets uh, through consumer preferences. Putting pressure on corporations is also another uh, another venue for change. Um, and then with that, I think I. I will stop and uh, I don't know if we take questions, if there's the ability to take questions, but I'd be happy to.